Hi right, guys, today we're going to flip the script a little bit. I have with me, I'm Bear, and this is Blackie Thomas. And I thought we would just do a little interview here for my channel. Kind of flip the script on you and see how you liked it. Today's discussion, what I thought I would talk to Blackie about, is how we both got involved in historical reenacting. Um, there's a there when we got in it way back when there was a lot of interest in it and over the last 25 or 30 years it's kind of waned but I was at a, a, a medieval fantasy fair about two weeks ago and there seems to be a little bit of a resurgence in, in reenacting now what I was at was not, his, not, I mean, there was not a whole lot of history involved in it, but it was a lot of fun. And I think that that element has been lost on a lot of people. But starting from the beginning, mm -hmm. tell, me, tell me how you got in. I got interested in living history like a lot of other people because of Walt Disney and Davy Crockett. Um, I fell in love with that story and uh, watched, you know, every Sunday you had the uh, World of Disney or whatever it was. Wonderful World of Disney. Wonderful World of Disney. And I remember when Davy Crockett came on and it was a series of four or five separate episodes con uh, concluding with him dying at the Alamo. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it just struck a chord with me, and I fell in love with it and uh, watched it. And then, of course, when Davy died, I cried for three days. I was a little bit of a kid. My Did, granny. Didn't we all? Oh, my <laughs> granny said it just broke my little heart. But the actor who did, uh, played Davy Crockett, Fess Parker, they also did a TV show called Daniel Boone. Mm -hmm. And uh, as our local TV and all was back in them days, old black and white TV with three channels. Um, in the morning was Captain Kangaroo, and then right after it was um, Daniel Boone. Reruns old 1950s TV show, Daniel Boone. So I watched every day, every Monday through Friday, I'd watch it. And then just as soon as it was over, I was in the backyard, you know, trying to mimic things I'd seen. I, I loved the coonskin cap and the look and the history. And I learned to read early on. And so my sister would take me to the uh, library and anything about David Cro Davy Crockett and anything about Daniel Boone or anybody about pioneers, I wanted to read it. Ironically, you said David. Mm -hmm. He actually preferred David Crockett Yeah. instead of Davy. Davy is something that Walt Disney invented, <clears throat> but the real man, actually preferred to be called David Crockett. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to echo what you were saying, you know, I watched Daniel Boone with Fess Parker on TV. Mm -hmm. I was watching uh, Captain Kangaroo too, by mm -hmm. the way. Uh, any John Wayne Western that I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's essentially the same time frame. And I was reading there was a, group, a book, a series of books in my school library called Dan Frontier. Yeah. And I read every Dan Frontier book that was on the shelf several times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I loved the the Disney movies, the Daniel, uh, the David Crockett, David Crockett movies. Mm -hmm. um, there were what three of them? Two of them? I think three or four. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember. Uh, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier, and I remember Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. Yeah. Those are the two that come to mind right and now. And then there's a two-parter for the Alamo. Uh-huh. So that's got to be the four. Yeah. But at, like you say, <clears throat> those influences mm -hmm. kept, piqued my interest. Do you remember Centennial? Oh, my God, yeah. That, that was my watershed, Mark. Um, I think the biggest nail in the coffin for me was uh, my dad uh, because my mom and my dad had split up when I was real small 
And on my dad's uh, weekend that had me for visitation, um, he took me to the theater where his buddy ran the theater. And um, we caught the, the two o'clock matinee and it was Jeremiah Johnson. Yeah. Well, my dad <laughs> thought it was going to be a Western and probably 15, 20 minutes into it, he figured out it wasn't anything he cared about because it didn't have guns and John Wayne in it. <laughs> and there wasn't nobody else in the theater. I remember there was like two people besides me sitting in there on that, after, that Sunday afternoon. And so he went up to the concession stand to talk to his buddy and left me sitting there, and I had just a religious experience watching that movie. And whenever we finally got done and we're leaving, I got in the truck, my daddy, he said, well, did you like it? I said, daddy, I'm gonna be a mountain man. And my daddy laughed and said, okay. Well, by God, you know, that and the other stuff, it kind of focused it. And I did not know that there were groups. You know, I'd see on TV about Civil War reenactors. But I didn't know of any other time. I figured, you know, maybe up yonder at Ticonderoga or something, there may be something, but nah. Yeah, we just never thought that it would be here. Yeah. And then there was a uh, field and stream did a thing showing the uh, eastern, no, excuse me, the western rendezvous. And I was blown away by that. That was right, probably about 81, 82. And as I got out of high school, I started talking to somebody and they said, well, there's a black powder club up here about 25 miles away. They shoot once a month. You may want to do that. I already had muzzle loaders. I didn't got into that. And so I showed up at the, the White Water Lawn Hunters and uh, they kind of took me under their wing and helped me. I had the interest and the knowledge and the willing to do the research, make the costumes and etc. And I already had the background of being a woodsman, of growing up in the woods. But this was taking the skills I had, but shifted to a different kind of equipment. And so instead of toting a, a kukri, I was toting a tomahawk. Instead of toting a, you know, such and such knife, at that time it was a tactical knife that I was dumb enough like a Rambo or something. Hey, scab. Yeah. I shifted <laughs> over and I was toting a historically correct knife or whatever. And, of course, I grew up doing a butcher knife, so I knew how to use that. And uh, sleeping underneath, instead of a, a poncho shelter, it was a canvas diamond. And so the, there was a lot of rollover in that. And so I got into it, and I really just, I mean, I took to it like a duck to water. Just loved it. So what was your first gathering, first reenactment? Uh, well, I, I fell under Rick Richter's wing. Yep. You remember Rick? Oh yes. You can't not help remember Rick. Oh, um, I like when Rick had a, a French. Uh, Rick Richter did a French courier de bois. Yeah. Seventeen uh, fifties persona, and he had this mustache that he would curl up the ends of his mustache. That I mean, curl both ends up like this, and he had tiny little silver bells on the end of his mustache. He was a character now. Still Loved is. It. Yeah. Um, Rick's first wife taught with my mother at our local junior college, and that's how I got to know Rick. And I expressed this interest with <clears throat> the books, the Daniel Boone, the Davy Crockett, the uh, Centennial. Mm -hmm. For those of you that don't remember, Centennial was a miniseries that came out around 1979, and uh, it was 12 parts, and the first four involved two men, uh, Alexander McKeague and a French trapper who was, a, Alexander was a Scotsman, a Scots trapper, and uh, a French Canadian named Pascanel. Mm -hmm. And for my two cents worth, after uh, McKeague died, it just sort of fell off by the wayside. I lost most of my interest. It's still a good show. I encourage you to watch it if you haven't seen it. But uh, it, my, that's sort of when, when McKee died, that's kind of where my interest in it ended. Uh, Michener, who wrote Centennial, for those of you that, that you want an in-depth knowledge, read Centennial. Read Michener, because he started with the formation of the planet 
<laughs> literally. Literally. And then by like <clears throat> chapter four, you're up to the age of the dinosaurs. And then what he's doing, he's telling you the history of Colorado yeah. and of this political governor's race that's going in. So like I said, he, so by the time of the mountain men of Pascanel and uh, the other gentleman, McKee. McKee, it's how their families opposing someone that was their rival back then are now running for governor against each other. And one's corrupt, one's not. But, when you put that book down, you had a working knowledge of the history of Colorado from the formation of the planet to present. I mean, that was Michener. Yeah, he had a magnificent gift for detail. And I think, if I remember right, Centennial is about 1,800 pages. Oh, it, 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 it's huge. It's like that. Um, but that's what I, I, I read Centennial. I uh, watched the miniseries. I got involved with the same group he did, Whitewater Long Hunters. In fact, we camped together up there at Whitewater one time. We were up in the old place up there, and I had already set up, and you came up, and I already had my diamond up, and I told you, to, you know, come sit down under here because it's starting to rain, and uh, we ended up pitching your diamond off one side and mine off the other, and we camped together. I remember that. <laughs> That was about 1985 or six. Long time ago. Yeah, I was still married to my first wife back then. As a matter of fact, if you'll look over Blackie's left shoulder, you'll see a sticker up about back here that says Whitewater Long Hunters. Uh, we're not as affiliated as we used to be, but we still love them dearly. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Coming into Whitewater through Lit, through Rick was my my first. Um, I have tried to get involved with uh, the <clears throat> excuse me with the French Marines at Fort Toulouse. Uh, I was not successful at doing that, and I also tried to get involved with the uh, the Tennessee militia right next door to Fort Toulouse at Fort Jackson. For the War of 1812 group. For the, yeah, for the War of 1812 group. And, you know, life being what it is, it's just, it hasn't worked out as successfully as I wish that it would. Well, I really value my time in doing the living history that, I mean, you got to understand, we kind of in those days kind of classified like three kinds of individuals. There were blue jean buckskinners, we called them, and those were people that had a historic costume. They were really there to be competitive shooters, and they just had to wear a costume to be able to compete. They didn't care about none of the history. They didn't care about the other skills. They were competitive shooters. And most of the time they had an RV or something in the parking lot where the rest of us are camping primitively. I remember them. Oh, yeah. We called them blue jean buckskinners. And then there was the Buckskinners, which was somewhere in the time period from 1640 to 1840. And they had the clothing and accoutrements of that, but it may be mixed times. So I may have a Revolutionary War time period gun, but I'm sleeping in a tent that really is minor 49er. You know, it's so a time period as long as you fit in. And then there were students of history the third group, and they narrowed it down to a specific year. So like my gear would be 1755. I didn't have anything past that point in clothing, gear, nothing. And I researched that time period. And that was, you know, like the three degrees, how deep you want to get into it. Um, but I really value my time in that because it, it taught me a lot of skills because you didn't have the modern nylon tents and stuff like that. You had to do what they had back then. Right. You know. <clears throat> I, uh, I would love to be as accurate as possible, but one advantage to what I do, would, and I try to portray the time period between about 1780 and, and 1820. A lot of stuff happened in that, mm -hmm. that time period. 
<clears throat> and you can vary your persona however you want to do it. Mm -hmm. But my big deal was was the money. Okay, mm -hmm. it, it's a fairly expensive hobby. It can be. It, it can be a fairly expensive hobby, just upfront and honest. And my thing was having the money to put it together. And if you can piecemeal it with a little bit from here and a little bit from there, by having a later persona, you can backfill with the other stuff that's still correct. Mm -hmm. It's still period correct, but it can also le lean toward getting you into an earlier time. Well, a, a really good resource is when we got to the big rendezvous, like the Eastern, Southeastern, stuff like that. What we're talking about big guys is a southeastern rendezvous was anywhere from say two, three, four thousand. I think the biggest we ever put on was eight thousand. And then there's the eastern rendezvous that I went to up in West Virginia, and they had fifty-two thousand people at that event. Literally, we were a city of fifty-something thousand people for ten days. Everybody living in canvas tents. It was massive. It really is kind of hard to envision but they would people would take their gear that they're getting rid of and put it out on a trade blanket in front so as you walked around you could piece together a gear an outfit buy the things that were being cast off from other people at a relatively cheap price or some way to barter for it when i got out of western mountain man when i first started out i was doing 1840 and uh, hawking guns and stuff like that and when I wanted to go back to War of 1812, I left the tent that morning toting a uh, hawk and I had built from a kit, full outfit. When I came back six and a half hours later, I was really about 1800. I had traded my gun, traded the clothes I was wearing had gotten traded as I had bought and traded for gear along the way and came back. Um, it took me six to seven hours to do it walking around that big event, but I managed to trade for what I needed to drop into earlier time period. So, which then I kind of stuck out from a group that I was with because everybody else was Western Mountain Man. Here I was. <laughs> now, I was 40 years before him then. But you were Lewis and Clark. Yeah, I was Lewis and Clark time period then. And uh, I left with a 54 caliber Hawking and I came back with a 62 caliber smoothbore. <laughs> and never regretted it. I loved my hawking, but I mean that smoothbore was so versatile. I mean, I, us, us poor boys from the south, we came up on shotgun. Yeah. I mean, that's what you did was a shotgun. And so shifting over to a flintlock shotgun, we understood shotgun. You know, a lot of these city boys didn't, but we did. And uh, my little short, handy, uh, two-liter chase. I took deer, hog, small game, and we would go out and do um, a weekend where we'd wear our gear and go hunting. Um, so you'd come out and spend the, the weekend in the woods actively camping with the historic gear and hunting for deer, whatever. You know, of course, we had to have legal orange. A lot of times I had that thing you saw whenever we did the squirrel hunt of me putting that on top, that's one of the things I did. I had a do-rag of bright orange that was a flat back behind me. And uh, I had a game warden come up one time and he looked at me and said, you're wearing more deer skins than I've seen. Because <laughs> I had leggings and wore a, a crow war shirt on and everything else and that bright orange head wrap. He had a good laugh out of that. But uh, I got a big fat doe that morning. What did John Leg that cut down the tule till he just got about almost down to a pistol grip? Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. they they were White Water Longhorns were serious <laughs> competition guys now, and uh, they were. Uh, uh, it was John Leg, and he would cut the barrel off one inch at a time, trying to find that maximum optimum. Place, the sweet spot. The sweet spot that would get the best group. And so he took a 34 inch long barrel and he'd cut it down to about 21 inches 
I think it's when he finally gave up and I ended up with that gun. So it had a short <laughs> barrel on it like that. But man, I loved it, man. It was a short and handy, quick shotgun to me. Yeah. But, I, you know, it was just, we learned so much. Um, <clears throat> and that was the thing in our living history days of learning how to read weather. Because you don't have a waterproof tent, you got a hunk of canvas. You do not have waterproof boots, you got moccasins. You know, your knife will rust. It's a carbon steel butcher knife. You have to check your gear. You have to carry a little bit of lard or bacon grease or some sort of tallow or something, or mixes of those to keep your blade stuff good, keep your gun working. Right. Our maintenance was a lot higher but it made us better <coughs> woodsmen because we think now in maintenance of all that gear. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun, and, and we're not done. No, we no, we're not done. We we keep a foot in it all the time. <coughs> there are uh, events coming up locally. <coughs> There's uh, they do things at Fort Mims. Mm -hmm. over north of Mobile in the Tensaw Delta. Fort Toulouse does a thing in the spring and fall. And I think it's every third Saturday the French Marines do a, do a program mm -hmm. uh, dur all, all through the year. I think they, they don't do it in like uh, January and February, but pretty much the rest of the year I, I believe they're active. Uh, then there's Alabama Frontier Days that comes in at Fort Toulouse in October. I believe it's October, yeah. yeah. You can go to their website <clears throat> and double check. You'll also, if you look up NMLRA, which is National Muzzleloading Rifle Association, and it will list where they are putting on, at one time there were 12, I think they're down to nine now, national rendezvous and these are huge gatherings of people and reenactors that want to come together and camp for a week or ten days shooting competition stuff like that and on usually a large portion of the camp is open to the public now it may just be on certain days but it'll tell you that usually the weekends they let just the public come in so you can see it go in look at the gear so if you're interested in this stuff, you can get involved and maybe learn where a local club somewhere near to you is holding matches and events so you got somebody to hang with, learn from, and get gear from like we've done. Because we always love new blood coming in because the stuff we want to get rid of, they're hunting. Yeah, and <clears throat> not only that, it keeps the group fresh. Oh yeah. Now are you going to get the person that comes in every once in a while who they're just there for show yeah. yeah but they get they're out pretty quick yeah yeah they don't usually last very long um i'd mentioned fort mims the uh the fort over at fort mims is unique to not only u.s history but alabama history <clears throat> or flip it not only unique to alabama history but to u.s history it has the sad uh, distinction of being the largest mass execution of uh, people prior to 9-11 mm -hmm. and it, it occurred in 1813 yeah. in it, August of 1813 it was retaliation <clears throat> where the year before right. the white settlers had waited till uh, the crops were almost ready to harvest of the Indians and they came in and burned up their crops. And they laughed about it, which meant a lot of, there were quite a few Indians starved to death that winter because they came in and burned up their crops. It was called burnt corn. Right, the Battle of Burnt Corn. And in the very next year, that's when the Indians retaliated. And that's when it was a big old huge fort and there was like 800 or 900 people in the fort. And the fort, the doors couldn't even be closed because so much dirt had been tracked in and out. The door, bottom of the doors were kind of buried. Yeah, the Indians over a period, over a span of time, <clears throat> when they would come into the fort to trade, would kick dirt up and block the door. And one foot at a time, one foot full at a time, they, they blocked those doors so that they couldn't, so that the 
the defenders couldn't shut it. The thing about it, the Battle of Fort Mims was also pretty much a family squabble mm -hmm. because almost everybody in the area was related <clears throat> and they were there were Indians who had married whites and whites who had married Indians and this whole area was pretty much related and they had sort of formed factions and the factions are what where the problems came in. And the fact that there wasn't an Alabama yet. No, it was Mississippi Territory. It was, Miss, it was the Indian Nation, the Creek Nation. Right. That fort was in the Creek Nation at that time. Now, because of that action, that massacre, that's what caused Jackson and them and a young man by the name of Davy Crockett to come south. And his first military action was to come to Alabama and fight in the Creek Indian War. Right. And then not long after the Creek Indian War, the land that had been conceded over to America became the state of Alabama very shortly afterward. Yeah, we became the territory of Alabama about 1817, which was... Two like years before two, it became three, a state. Years, yeah, but it was like uh, three years, two years after the war, the Creek Indian War ended. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned Fort Jackson which is right next door to Fort Toulouse. You can go there today, it's outside of Wetumpka. <clears throat> and you can see the old ramparts that Jackson's men built. They're still there. And uh, it's where Jackson received the surrender of William, Rather William Weatherford, who was also known as uh, Red Eagle. Red Eagle. He was the chief of the Creek Nation, and he was only one sixteenth Indian. Mm -hmm. He was Scott, but he was in charge of the thing. There's a complex political dynamic down here in the South that they don't teach in the books that's kind of off topic from what we were going to be talking about, but in a nutshell, when the, uh, the Scots came into Georgia and founded the colony of Georgia, once their servitude, their indentured servitude were over, most of them would migrate into what is now the Indian Nations, or now the state of Alabama, and are intermarried into the tribes. Well, they became the leaders of the tribes by the early 1800s. And so the head of all the tribes, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, etc., was actually, usually, some form of uh, Indian white cross, you know, hybrid, that uh, was had been risen up in elevation inside the tribe and become the chief. But so his name is Red Eagle. He's also, you William know, Weatherford. William Weatherford. Billy Bowles was the, the, the head of the, the Creek Nation and he was as pale skinned as anybody else. He'd, he was a white guy. But at the time period, they, there's a lot of history there they just brush over. But there was a lot of, uh, really it was more like a civil war down here yeah, amongst families and stuff <clears throat> of which side wanted to stay dominant with the Indian side and which side wanted to stay dominant with the Americans and the settlers coming in. You know, are we part of this tribe or are we part of this? And that was a big part of it. Not that terrible long ago, uh, during the Revolutionary War down in the South had been a really a civil war because, between those who were loyal to the king and who were you know, American patriots. The right. two fought like crazy down here, but you hear about Washington's battles and all like that because they had the reports coming out in the papers. They didn't talk about what was happening down here because it didn't fit their interest. You know, that's out in the frontier. That's out on the right. <coughs> we don't care about that. What's happening in Boston this week, you know? Yeah, uh, building off of that, the uh, this area where we're sitting now was Spanish territory. This was Spanish Florida, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, I'm, try I'm trying to envision the map in my head. I apologize, but in Eufaula, there is a there's a series of streets called Boundary Street. And that had a double meaning. Not only was it 
but south of Boundary was Indian territory. It was also Spanish territory. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we would be sitting now in what was not only Creek territory, but it was claimed by Spain. And uh, the Spanish, you know, they, they came up to Jacksonville, roughly, area of Jacksonville, St. Augustine, um, and then moved across uh, this area. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. We had uh, the, the boundary in South Georgia was kind of iffy. Fuzzy and bad. Yeah. <clears throat> but you get across the Chattahoochee River into what is now Alabama, it was pretty, pretty fixed. And it was roughly a line that went from Eufaula over to just south of Montgomery and then down toward Mobile and Pensacola. Which at the same, or not, you got to remember, this was also part of French Louisiana. They, yeah. they call it territory. the five flags of Alabama because there were five separate national flags or flags mm -hmm. that covered Alabama history because it, at one moment, this was part of the Louisiana Territory and France claimed it. At the same moment, we were part of the Creek Nation. At the same moment, we were part of the Spanish holdings. You know, everybody claimed over each other and as long as we're not arguing over it, I'll claim it too type deal. It, yeah. it, was, it was a lot of history and we spent a lot of time learning this history, not to bog y'all down with it, but it made a very deep, rich background to go researching through. It really does. Um, we mentioned Fort Toulouse. Fort Toulouse was a fort in French held territory from 1715 until 1757. It was the farthest east, I, don't quote me on those dates, that's close though. It was the farthest east settlement. Uh, 1762. 62. 62, that's whenever yeah. the French and Indian War had ended and they had to give up their forts. Right. They kept Louisiana territory, <coughs> but they had to give up their forts and right. all the military had to leave. Pretty much everything east of the Mississippi. So that was the end of them and they, they as they left the fort, they had spiked the cannons and they rolled them off on that right outside the door and those cannons lay in the dirt until the 1920s at the beginning of the no yeah yeah end of the beginning of the great depression when somebody finally got them for scrap metal and and hauled them off with mules to sell for scrap metal that's a shame so they had been there over almost almost 200 years almost 200 years laying out there and people yeah. go out there and look at them the old Spanish, old french cannons yeah uh, <clears throat> but uh, Toulouse was a very prominent fort. It was mentioned in uh, in transcripts going out of out of the Spanish, out of the French. You know, the French were in Mobile, and as well as New Orleans and Pensacola. But it was mentioned in dispatches from Mobile that actually went to Versailles. Yeah. And King Louis the Fourteenth. Sun King actually knew of Fort Toulouse. Let's go by. But anyway, that's the environment that we grew up in, and it's really hard not to get interested in it. Yeah. At least for us, it was it was not hard at all to get interested in it. Well, our dense woods, you know, especially when you're young, knowing this history, and then you'd go out and be exploring in the woods, you're looking for signs of this stuff. You know, we found arrowheads, we found pottery all the time. Uh, my granddaddy found a bronze cannon, actually a cannonade, probably about that long, back in the 1930s in Pea River Swamp. And- uh, I wonder where that came from. No idea. But he, he uh, him and his brother had gone down to this place and it was a real swampy area and they were fishing and he saw this turtle come up on the, a log and he shot the turtle 
and the bullet went through the turtle and on the log showed up this shiny spot. And what it was, that cannon barrel laying there. He was up on the cannon barrel. Yep. And so they managed to dig it out and he was gonna sell it for scrap. And somebody pointed out, you know, that somebody might want that. He thought it was a, a you know, Civil War cannon. Yeah. And so they hauled it to Montgomery to the state archives and the guy came out and looked at it in the back of the pickup truck and told him, no, that's not Civil War, that's probably back in uh, French, you know, French and Indian War time period. Granddad had never heard of such thing, and he paid my granddad, I think, $35 for it. Well, that, in, in the Depression, $35 was a right That was a lot of money, money. you know. That, that was, it was well worth it hauling to Montgomery. And when, it, of course, when I heard that story, and then all of us, and you take a field trip up there, Back in our day, you did, and uh, the school would take you up there once a year. At, I think it was fourth or fifth grade. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. We went up there to the state archives, and I made a point of asking the curator about us. Said my granddaddy brought y'all a cannon. I would like to see that cannon, and he had no clue. And I got a dress where I could send letters, and I sent letters back and forth to that guy for nearly eight months. He went back to the records, found where it had been entered in to the the state register, and then that's as far as he knows, it probably ended up getting donated someplace or whatever, but I'd love to find out where that cannon went. I'd love to see that cannon. Yeah, you know, think about the French being here during the time period. It could very well have been a patrol from Fort Toulouse, yeah. a patrol of French Marines that lost it. Well, over on the, uh, the Chattahoochee River. Uh, the ironclad <clears throat> battleships of the Civil War built up there at Columbus. Right. And matter of fact, there's a maritime you know, Columbus. Uh, the uh, Confederate Naval Museum is at Columbus. Yeah. And when the Yankees captured one of their big ships, what are you gonna do with it? They're cavalry, so they just burned it. Yeah. And for up till the 1960s, it was sitting out there on, in the water. It just burned down a water line, and at low water, you'd actually see the hull of the ship. And uh, they finally went in and salvaged it and put it in the museum and et cetera. But when we were coming up, you know, not only were we out here hunting, we were out here expo exploring, looking for stuff, and we were also out here playing around, hoping to stumble up on some old war relic or something hidden down here in these swamps and stuff like that because you could just a young man's mind you could just see it dude that we we're gonna come up and there's gonna be a napoleon cannon sticking out of the mud or some confederate whatever sticking out you know we all of us kept looking for something like that and then we're gonna clean it up and shoot it oh yeah yeah absolutely uh, it didn't matter it had been in the mud for a hundred years that wouldn't matter to us What's a little mud? What's a little mud? Yeah, thank God we never did, or we'd have blowed ourselves to pieces. Oh, Lordy. Well, anything else you want to talk about, brother? I think we've covered a large bit of, what, of, of why we got of, into of this. Why we got into it. Very circuitous route. Mm -hmm. But that maybe that will will give you a little bit of an idea, and who knows, it may even inspire you you can find uh, there are reenactment groups literally all over the planet. Mm -hmm. Of all kinds of time periods. Oh yeah, In most any time period you want. Um, <clears throat> I have a, uh, I guess you would call him a nephew, uh, my ex-wife's nephew, who is in a reenactment group over in Dale County that does Vietnam. Yeah. A Vietnam, re I've, give, I've donated gear to them, because like the shirt I'm wearing right here is a Vietnam era shirt that I've had for God, knows, probably since the 70s, you know, and I had a bunch of them, and I had some that were just too small for me anymore, and I donated to him a set of boots, a pair of pants, and several pieces of, of LBE and stuff like that, because when I got it, it was surplus. And new. And new, basically, <laughs> and I hunted and fished and used it and camped with it all in years. I mean, this shirt was, is probably a 1966 shirt. I still wear it as an everyday bushcraft shirt. And it works. And it works. Um, but when you're looking at something like this that's pushing 70 years old, 
you know, 60, 70 years old now. Let's see, it'd be 40 and 20, yeah, 60, 65 60 years, years old. old. And it, the gear is still being used. That says something about why we use surplus gear now, don't it? Yeah. This shirt that I've got on is from my reenacting days. It's um, <clears throat> pre-1840, mm -hmm. probably uh, post-1790. So it fits my time period very well. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can roll the sleeves down and button them and put on an ascot, button up my collar and put on an ascot, and I'm there. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, once we started doing it, I got to wearing uh, breech clout and leggings and the long hunter shirt for the historic reenactment stuff. But I found it was so effective as field gear. I mean, once you spend a week wearing that, going through the woods, putting on blue jeans is like you know being saran wrapped. I mean, you just do not want to walk in, in modern pants anymore because th those clothing were so free and it's so easy to step and move your legs and everything else. Modern clothes is so restrictive compared to that that I've walked into McDonald's before, you know, wearing breech clout and leggings and just a, a long t-shirt on top and nobody even noticed. I thought that was funny as all get out, but you know, coming from a reenactment, I just changed shirts all the essentials were covered. All so the essentials were covered. I drove in. I wanted to get me something to eat, and I pulled in. You know, I come in wearing moccasins and leggings, and they didn't even pay attention. That's another day in Alabama. Don't worry about it. It's blacky. It's blacky. Just, just keep going. It. But, yeah, I think we've, we've covered mm -hmm. pretty much all of it. And maybe it will encourage you to go out there and, and expand your horizons. There's a lot of opportunity for, as I call it, creative engineering in the reenacting community. And you may find out that you like it. But anyway, thank you for joining us. I would ask that you like, share, and subscribe. And I'm Bear. I'm Blackie. Thank you for joining us today on Bears Old Ways.